And my last act in said position was to, uh, my, my job is to get you quiet and to introduce a man who needs no introduction. So ladies and gentlemen, Brett Cow. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone, and uh, I'm really honored to be here tonight, and this is going to be a really special night uh, for a, a number of reasons, and we have some surprises for you, but we want to welcome you here to the, uh, the Josh Minor Dialogue. Um, so I, I, have, I have this uh, love of serendipity, and I want to try to have this little serendipity theme tonight, so um, although it sounds like I'll be talking a lot about myself, it'll eventually get to Mike. So let me uh, just uh, try this here. But uh, but tonight it's uh, I, I I was on the uh, on NIRAC and I was on the conference committee um, many years ago, and I had this first serendipitous moment that I was at the Harvard Ed School and I saw Josh Miner speak, and after that speech, I thought he would be a great keynote speaker for AE. I mean, come on, this is, this is perfect. And so I approached Josh and he said, you know, he would consider it and to send him the dates and so, and so that's what I did. And so I uh, had this great serendipitous moment to, to meet this man. And I know many of you know Josh Miner, um, who really is essential in bringing our bound to the United States and, and really the foundation, I guess, for why all of us are here, right? Bringing these ideas from Kurt Hahn in England to us. So tonight, I, uh, I have this, well, serendipity number two is that secretly in my mind, I thought um, that I would, you know, need to come talk with Josh and like, you know, talk about AEE, maybe, um, I, I imagine we're gonna become friends. We're gonna spend all this time together. This is my excuse, and so I'd say like, well, I'll bring the contract by your house. Um, I will, uh, <laughs> um, and so I, I did those things, but Josh, I found, was incredibly busy. He was busier than me, a PhD student, um, you know, on NIRAC. Um, he was gone all the time, but the, the wonderful serendipitous part is that I met his wife, Phoebe, and she was just a very kind and generous woman, and she, I remember she even, like, sat me down in the back, and we had some uh, lemonade, and we kind of talked about the, the contract and what Josh was to do, and, and, uh, and so that was really... Um, that was, that was a really wonderful experience. Well, as you know, the story goes that Josh came to, uh, to the conference, he gave this keynote speech, and he just blew the doors off the place. Um, everyone sort of came up afterwards, and this is kind of the day it was, is, uh, as people go, do we get that on uh, VHS? Um, and, uh, you know, is it taped? Can we see this again? And so, uh, and we just realized that we didn't have it. It was so good and so wonderful, and it was like that magic moment that, that we, we lost a bit. And then uh, someone reached out to Josh and said, can we get your speech, did you have it written down? And it, the answer was no, it's just off the top of his head, he just gave this incredible talk. Um, so unfortunately, um, just a few months later after that, we, we lost Josh, he passed away, and there was this feeling in NIRAC that that we, we just lost this, this moment. It's just, people just dreamed that we had this on, on video or DVD or some way to capture that. But for those of us there, we just really carry that with us. It's a really special moment. Um, the next sort of serendipitous moment is uh, my good friend Preston Klein and I um, were driving to a NIRAC uh, meeting and we're talking about what to do about this and this idea of trying to capture these memories and pitched this idea to each other. We pitched the idea to NIRAC about a, the Josh Minor dialogue series. And this is what we've come to today. And so it's a really, uh, I feel a special connection to this because I remember being in the car talking about this. And, uh, and now we've had, a, I don't know, the 16 years, I think? Yeah. 18 years? Or, I'm not going to count right so now. So many names are going to change the banner. So, what's that? So, so many, many names, names are going to change the banner. Change the banner. <laughs> um, but I want to talk a little bit about. Um, about Phoebe Miner, and so uh, Josh and, and Phoebe um, were were married in the 40s. Uh, the, Phoebe was a, I think, a, a housewife in the 50s, in a time um, when I was sort of thinking about. Well, I, well, I met Josh's granddaughter, and I was talking to her, and I said, "You know, do you think your grandmother had a lot to do with Outward Bound? Because this is kind of." time when women would, would like stay at home and like support their husbands and have these sort of traditional sex roles and I wondered if she went unrecognized maybe for some of that and so um, she uh, so 
Marilyn went and talked to her grandmother, and she said, uh, you know, Grammy, do you, did you, uh, do you think you helped Grandpa start Outward Bound? Were you involved in that? Were you sort of essential? And this is her, her, her turn, says, um, oh yes, dearie, oh yes. <laughs> So I, one of the things I want to do tonight is I, I really want us to um, think about and recognize Phoebe Miner. Unfortunately, we just lost Phoebe uh, 10 days ago. And, uh, and, but to me, I think that oftentimes we have these unsung heroes in, uh, in our midst and after education. And, so, and, and she's, she's obviously one of them. And so, uh, so I'm really, um, really glad that we could sort of um, uh, think about Phoebe tonight. Uh, other serendipitous moment is that through Marilyn, uh, I met her dad, uh, Dan, and Dan Miner has come here tonight, and I'd like Dan to maybe say a few words about his dad and his mom, and uh, if you don't mind, Dan, so can you give a big hand for Dan Miner? First of all, I, I do mind. <laughs> Because um, this, I don't really have much prepared, but uh, it is a real privilege to be here. And uh, since my dad was so busy, uh, he, he really wasn't around for my upbringing. No, he was a great dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that I could honor him with maybe an anecdote. Uh, but he and he would he would want me to say something like this, which is uh, to him. Uh, he was an educator, or he liked to refer to himself as a fraud. He said, I'm a fraud. And I feel like I'm a fraud because I'm a doctor. I don't know anything about what you people do except through my dad and through the brief time I've known you. And uh, he said, I'm a fraud, Danny, because I'm not a mountain man. I haven't climbed Everest like Willie Unsold, my vice president. I haven't, uh, you know, river kayaked. And what the heck am I doing? But it's because I'm an educator. And education is my passion. And I happened to hit on a good idea. It wasn't even my idea. And he told me, if you have one good idea in your life, you're very lucky. Even if it's not your idea. If it's an idea that can light a passion. It's true. Yeah. Outward Bound was not his idea, but he decided to de dedicate his life to bringing Outward Bound to the US and to using it as a tool towards education. So he was an educator that used our man, and uh, he used to, uh, so one quick uh, uh, device that he came up with was called the quiet walk. Does anybody here know what the quiet walk is? So you go to an hour bound course, and you get out of your cars and your buses, and you end up getting into your group, a small group of 12 with other instructors, and they say, we're going to go on a nice quiet walk now. And you think, oh, shoot, should I put on my sneakers? And there's no time. So the instructor takes off, and you all take off after him, and then he starts jogging. And <laughs> you start jogging, and then he takes off out of the, off the trail, and then now you're bushwhacking. And you're, you know, you're in your nice clothes and your street shoes, and now you come to a swamp. And he just barrels right through the swamp, and then you come to a creek, and you, now you need help to get across the creek. Pretty soon, an hour and a half later, you're back, and you're a mess. And that was your quiet walk. But <laughs> what, what my dad used to talk about was uh, that education comes from the Latin, everybody knows, educo, which means to lead out. And this is one of the few times that the instructors in Outward Bound actually lead you out. After that, it's, the instructors are hands off. You do all the, all the stuff. They don't lead you anywhere. But it's to lead you out. And the idea that he had another idea, which was tell the teachers to stop teaching, which is, you know, the answer to any question is meaningless unless the kid asks. And that was another tenet of his. So use the wilderness, let them figure it out, lead them out for the quiet walk, and then, and then they're on their way. Thank you well, for Danny, letting me Thank speak. you so much for uh, sharing. I really thank, thank Dan for those words. And uh, uh, we're going to have another guest speaker, surprise guest speaker in a moment. But, um, but I want to I start the, our, uh, our uh, next serendipity story, I guess. It happens in 1985. 
Um, as some of you know, I just invented um, wilderness therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I was a psychology major at the University of New Hampshire, and people were sending me. Someone said, you got to go talk to this guy, Mike Gass, and I ended up in Mike Gass's office, and I said, oh, I have my idea. I actually called it active therapy, um, and it's kind of telling them about it, and he sort of smiled and kind of like, yeah, it's discovered, and, you know, uh, and, and I was really thrilled, like, wow, this is, this is really great, and, uh, and so to me, not knowing at that moment, sitting down with this guy, that this is, not going to do it too soon, but, uh, but, you know, this is like a life-changing moment for me very, very important person in my life that changed my life, I'm meeting at that moment. And so it's just a great serendipitous, I don't know, I don't know how I ended up at the University of New Hampshire other than it was a state school and that's the only one I could afford and you know, it wasn't like a big plan, I guess, but I ended up just in the, in the right place. And so, I, and I, I guess that day I say like, I entered this really great club of people and who uh, have their life changed by Mike Gass. Um, most of us know Mike as an accomplished researcher, author, speaker, uh, teacher. He's just been such an important person uh, to so many students, to so many people around the world. Um, and so we have, we have a, one of uh, Mike's friends and admirers here, um, Fred Bramante. And I wonder, Fred, if you wouldn't mind coming up and uh, speaking a little bit. And uh, Fred is on the New, was, used, was on the New Hampshire Board of Education, and he's, he's a, a, a politician owner of a great music store and he is a, a great advocate for experiential education and so he and Mike could work together and I was hoping maybe great uh, thank you thanks for asking uh, so uh, uh, I, I ran for governor and I lost and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, one of the people uh, that worked on my campaign uh, went to work for, uh, in the next election cycle, went to work for uh, uh, Craig Benson, uh, who was running for governor of New Hampshire. And, uh, and she uh, told him that, you know, you, you really need to talk to Fred about education. So, um, so uh, Craig and I talked. Um, he asked me to work on his campaign. And uh, he ended up becoming governor of New Hampshire and asked me to chair the New Hampshire State Board of Education. And then he asked me to redesign public education, a charge that most people would have run screaming away from. <laughs> and, but it was exactly the charge that I was looking for, because uh, I was a terrible student, like the worst. In my high school, I finished uh, 206 out of 212 kids. I beat six kids. So. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so uh, and, and fortunately for me, I, I majored in science. And even though uh, in college I only had a 2.3 a GPA, because as I said, I hated school. But I majored in an area where there are not a lot of teachers. And so even I got a, a job teaching science. And uh, <laughs> so I did, that for, uh, I did that for six years. Uh, but making a teacher's salary, I had started a little family, and um, and I was poor, and I needed some extra money. So I was, uh, uh, I had played in a rock band when I was in college, and uh, and through my rock band, I ended up starting this little company with my life savings of six hundred dollars, uh, and. Uh, a company called, um, I'm going to tell you the name of the company, and I'll bet some of you in the room have, have heard of it. Uh, I started a company called Daddy's Junkie Music Stores. Mm -hmm. Has anybody heard of Daddy's? Yeah. Look at the hands. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, so I started Daddy's with, uh, uh, with $600, and we turned it from the smallest of over 11,000 music stores in the United States to the 15th largest in the country, and it was an absolutely amazing ride. And uh, all along the way, that uh, as co the company has grown, people were asking me to do interviews and, um, and uh, do articles on the company. And I started thinking, I, I guess they don't know that I'm not very bright. I'm, I'm not going to tell them. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so then after a while, I started thinking, maybe I'm not as dumb as I thought. And I started getting angry about it. And um, so I have spent the better part of my adult life trying to figure a, a way to do education that even someone like like me could be a, a success. So the, when the governor gave me this charge, I took it on and um, 
uh, excited about taking it on. And, and uh, I remember telling the state board, the rest of the state board members, governor told me that he wants a new system. Um, I said, I don't know what, what it, that system looks like, but I'm a 60s kind of guy who was taught to question authority. And I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions and we'll find out where this thing goes. And ultimately, um, we, you know, what we came to was that, you know, that, you know I, uh, the governor told me, he said, I want you to challenge everything. So I remember sitting down with members of the board and the members of the commissioner's cabinet, and, and they, uh, he had this, uh, the person chairing this committee said, uh, let's get through the easy stuff, the school calendar. We're not going to change anything there. And I said, wait a minute. Why does it have to be 180 days? Who cares about whether it's 180 days? So we took 180 days out of the regulations, first state in the United States to do it. But then we started talking about high school graduation requirements. And why is it that you get credit for time? The amount of time you sit in a class, whether or not you actually learn, if you get an A, B, a C, or a D, you still pass, they move you on to the next level. And we just figured it out on that, like it was like an epiphany moment that it should be based on learning. And who cares where the learning takes place? And we started talking about all kinds of ways that kids can learn other than sitting in a traditional classroom. And when it became clear to all of us that we were going to move down this experiential learning path, that it was, I mean, I was so excited, I couldn't believe it. It was like, I went home, told my wife about it. And she said, I can't believe nobody thought of this. But obviously, people have thought of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but I but I it was it was brand new to me. So uh, so you know so it was like how do I get information? How do I learn more about this? So someone said, Fred, there's this guy at UNH, Mike Gass. I need you to go talk to him. And uh, and so uh, you know I would go to to Mike and to Pam, um, and they were my guides on trying to understand this notion of experiential learning and what we have done in New Hampshire and put it in the state regulations and it is now spreading across the United States is this notion that learning can happen anytime, any place. It should be based on the kids' interests, passions and dreams. And you know, I draw this picture of the old model. This is, you know, classrooms, online learning and experiential learning, this little tiny piece. And in the future, those three circles are going to be the same size. And they're going to link in a Venn diagram. And for virtually every kid, sometimes they're going to be in the classroom, and sometimes they're going to be online, and sometimes they're going to be in a real-world environment. And that's the way education should be. Ultimately, a customized education for every single kid. So what you guys have known for a long, long time, and which, where I got my training wheels from Mike and from Pam, that... Um, that we are taking this, this, this model and it is, it is going to be the future of education in the United States. So I, you know, as Dan told me that Mike was getting this award tonight, I had to be here. It was important to me to, to come and say thank you very much, Mike, because you were important to me in helping me to get, you know, as I said, my training wheels uh, so that uh, we could move this thing forward. So, Mike, yeah. thank you so much. almost word for word what I was going to say next. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, thank you very much, Fred. Um, let's get to the fun part here. Look at this cowboy. <laughs> I think it, uh, um, one of the things when you have a mentor like Mike, um, and Mike, Mike is a fairly private person, and, and he does this great way, he does this great way of like kind of getting you to talk about yourself and, and before I even know it, I, Mike hasn't disclosed anything about himself and I told him everything, we have a very harmonious partnership this way. We, um, <laughs> but uh, but I, loved, I always loved in college, we'd find this little nugget about Mike and it would just be, oh wow, like Mike did this or Mike did that. And, uh, and so I just love to just want to share with you a few pictures about, about this man who we, we respect and love. So. Uh, this is, a, this is Mike and, uh, Mike's attempt to try to get into the, the cover of Climbing Magazine. Um, and this is, a, and Mike, what's the name of this, this climb at the time? Uh, Country Club Crack. Country Club Crack, which is like, I believe this is like the most difficult 
roof yeah, at the time. What's the most difficult crack climbing in, in the world? In the world. Um, and so, you know, if we only had GoPros back then. You know? <laughs> Think of how much footage we'd have of Mike doing these things. It would have been great. Um, I also want to know about, you know, uh, you know understand people who, uh, who've carried the load, and not just metaphorically, <laughs> they've really carried the load at times. And so, so this here's Mike, and this, that pack is uh, large. <laughs> I love this photo. This is, uh, this is Mike, um, uh, what do you say, paddling in a non-credited manner. <laughs> so I have here. <laughs> And Mike, as uh, you know, as, a, as some of you know, is a great friend, Craig Dawkin, and they they really are uh, our pair. And uh, this is this is uh, Craig and Mike, and I like the uh, the Boston to Baltimore uh, bike ride that we see here. Um, and through Craig, Mike, um, I don't know if many people know that Mike was a uh, uh, a football star in high school and in college, and he played tight end. Um, which all seem to lead, lead up to the sport that I think he really loves in his days of playing rugby. And, uh, so here's Mike Gass, I say in the days when shorts were short <laughs> and socks were long. Um, oh, let's see there. Uh, here's Mike and uh, what he's doing right here is he's telling you about the uh, what experiential vacation is. Cross your arms. <laughs> here, here it is. Or again. <laughs> so those of you that don't know that about Mike, ask him like just just ask someone who's from UNH and they'll let you know. Um, um, so Mike has Mike has gifted us, you know, as a, a researcher. He's had over a hundred uh, scholarly pu publications, uh, and fourteen books, twenty-five book chapters, sixty-one peer-reviewed papers that he's published. Um, and he's given us great books like uh, the Book of Metaphors. This one we're going to skip over because that's not his. Um, <laughs> but the uh, but Amazon thinks it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, adventure therapy, uh, effective leadership and adventure programming, which this is the, uh, the most popular text in, in outdoor leadership in the country. Uh, Mike was instrumental in establishing the Brown Center, and this is a, uh, a letter about that, establishing the Brown Center from uh, President Gordon Holland of UNH. Uh, but I think that uh, most of all, Mike is uh, really, truly a family man. I, he loves his family. and. Uh, and I think this is kind of, this one, this little anecdote I think really describes Mike to me, is that uh, I know when, when, when my wife Beth and I were, uh, when she was pregnant and we're thinking about having a family, what we did is we got like the Barry Brazelton book and we started like looking through and trying to learn something. And probably a lot of us do that. Some of you might build a crib or do something. And so what Mike did is he uh, got a doctorate in family therapy. <laughs> 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 that is Mike. Right? Um, he loves his family. Here's his, his daughter, and I think his daughter has probably honored him, I know, uh, in such a special way by um, coming to UNH, majoring in outdoor education, um, and, uh, and she's now a wilderness therapist. And so uh, I know that she. Uh, not only has her has her dad as a as as a father figure, but also her professional role model, and I think that that's got to be really special. Um, here's Mike with his son Tony, and uh, and one of the things I, that Mike did, didn't talk about a lot, but I would see him. And Tony went to went to college in Baltimore, and uh, and Mike was always flying to Baltimore, trying to catch as many soccer games as he could, um, and he's a really devoted father and. He has just this like this wonderful family. Um, his his youngest son Andrew is um, has worked for me. He's a great guy, and what my wife says is he's very popular at the town beach. Seems to have like a lot of young women following around. So <laughs> um, but the Gas family is just a, a wonderful family, and they've always been so um, willing to help in sort of any moment. 
And uh, and I know um, all kinds of people in Durham and and around around the country who get all the support for Mike. So just a few more slides here um, of Mike, but I want to. Uh, <laughs> I make sure I wasn't wearing the same shirt. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, Mike's an innovator, a researcher, a creator, and a thinker, and he has has made such a tremendous contribution to uh, to outdoor education. And so I, I'm going to encourage you in a moment to give Mike sort of the, the the a fraction of the applause that he deserves. But um, but I want to talk about the biggest serendipitous moment for me um, is is that moment of just having that moment that meeting Mike and having him in my life. I never knew that he would, uh, you know, be at my family's wedding, that he'd become my, uh, I shouldn't have looked at you. <laughs> uh, um, you know, my mentor, my graduate advisor, um, the chair of my uh, dissertation, um, my PhD. Um, and one of the things I always cherish about Mike, I've never had someone that was so happy to see me married and to have a son. And when I brought my son to him, Mike just loves kids and that, that just made me feel so connected to, to him and all the love that he has. So uh, I want you to please uh, welcome our Josh Miner uh, dialogue speaker um, this year, Mike Cass. most about teaching is I get a chance to touch the future. My teacher. And I've learned more from this one than I've learned from, than she's learned from me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a series, they have a series of questions they're going to ask and there are other questions if you want to ask me on the board back there, we'll get those woven in somehow. Yeah. So. Is this, is this on? No. Yeah. Is that better? No, not yet? Okay, there we go. Um, so I wanted to start just by saying that I've been carrying this around all day, um, trying to figure out how to get my body through this sheet of paper. I don't know if that's been perplexing anybody else. Um, for those of you that weren't in Nate Pullen's uh, play note last night, you'll have to ask somebody what I'm talking about. But um, in all seriousness, I've been carrying this around all day in my pocket, wondering how I was going to show up tonight for this um, great, great night and this honor. Um, and so I just wanted to share with you all that I am showing up as a student of Mike's. I did my undergrad at outdoor or at UNH studying outdoor education and I'm back there now getting my dual master's degree. Um, so I'm showing up as a student of Mike's, but, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm already emotional. I knew if he was gonna cry, I was gonna cry. Um, I'm also showing up as somebody that looks at Mike as a mentor, as I'm sh sure many of you do. And just to share a, a quick little uh, story about me is when I was deciding to come back to grad school, I met with Mike in New Hampshire a couple years ago and I also had this big idea that I wanted to tell him about. I, he said, okay, come over, let's go get lunch in the dining hall. And um, he took me out to lunch and said, tell me about your big idea. And I said, well, I'm going to build a 170 foot sailboat that costs $10 million and I'm going to sail all over the world with college students doing accredited uh, semester programs. And he looked at me and said, that's a great idea. How can I help? <laughs> Which um, I just wanted to kind of pull the audience here and, and get a show of hands. Has anyone come to Mike with an idea and had him respond, how can I help? A lot, a lot of folks here from UNH in the front. And um, I just think that's such a testament to 
who Mike is, he, he gives so much of himself to other people and supporting, I know for me, he just, he, he always just supports my ideas and my dreams. When most people look at me and say, oh, that's crazy, you're never gonna raise $10 million. Mike says, let's make it happen. So um, that's, that's the person I'm showing up as tonight, a student, but also someone who really appreciates Mike as a mentor. And I'll hand this over to Pam. Thank you, Casey. Um, who am I showing up as? As a person with profound gratitude. Similar to Brent, though five years prior, in 1980, I had just come back from a Knowles semester course, and the only reason I was at UNH was to row crew. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and uh, I, for the third semester in a row, I didn't get a single class I had signed up for, and I was kind of done. It's time to pack up and go back to Jersey and figure it out from there. There was a flyer that talked about rock climbing. And, uh, and as I headed down, um, ready to pack my bags and get out, because of course the class was full, uh, and I was just turning around, and Mike goes, but wait a minute you're more than a person that can't get into rock climbing. Tell me more. 35 years later, I'm still telling, and he's still <laughs> listening. <laughs> One of the things with Casey and myself, uh, meeting with Mike prior to this and saying, how can we really make this special? As those who know Mike, he said, well, what about the audience? <laughs> like, what do you mean about the audience? This is about you. <laughs> and um, I said, okay, I'll figure out something. So what I <laughs> somewhat figured out was those index cards. So take a moment. If you haven't written on one, this is your chance to ask a question of Mike by writing it on the index cards and passing it to the middle aisle. And we're going to have a service crew come on up and give me the index cards. And as Casey is asking questions, I'll be going through and we'll see what we have time. So, I give you a topic, ask a question of Mike, discuss, write, pass to the middle, take a minute or two, so go for that. I'm trying to hit home runs with every student I meet. And I want someone like Bridget to come up and say, I won't make her come up there, but she's looking at me smiling. <laughs> and I'm saying when she comes to me and says, that was the best class I ever had in my life. And I turned to her and I said, we're just getting started. Yeah. And then to Brad, to honor him, we had a thing where I was, I walked up and I said, have everyone signed a name on the inside of a t-shirt? And we did that, and I said, there's someone I want to honor this day. And I, and I brought up Brad, and I talked about how he's contribute more. He's kind of the silent person of our equipment room, and how he just goes about his art form on his own. And what it is is that everyone in class had signed their names on the front and the back, and I had him put on an outdoor education t-shirt, and I said, notice that on your there, the ones on the back, those are all your classmates that are patting you on the back. And the ones on the front, those are the ones that are closest to your heart. Have you worn that shirt? Great. <laughs> so we need, one of the things that Viktor Frankl says that I believe that I've shared with a lot of the students in preparation for today, is that you need to teach to where students can be if they're exceptional. Don't teach to where they're at or where they are because then they'll just stay the same. But if you create a spark inside of them, because they have to overemphasize themselves, that's where we should be teaching them. And that's what I try to do with each one of them. So what's your advice to the emerging professionals as they strive to make a positive impact in the field? I think I'll go back to what Fred said. What we're doing is important. What we're do and we're, that, we're more than that speck, we're growing there. 
Each and every person in this room was brought to this room because of the passion you felt and you've seen in the clients you've worked with. The spark with Casey, the spark with Ben, Min, the group that's going to Nepal, that opportunity, that's why we're important. And what you're doing, you may not feel it, and I'm working really, really hard to try to make us validated through our research and what we do. So, uh, with Anita, we've led great promise for adventure therapy in the field. I couldn't have done any of that without her. Um, but United, I've created something that I never thought I could do. That type of work needs to happen across all of us here. And we need to support one another. And ask tough questions, but also know how important we are. So thanks, Fred. A little twist here. Okay. From what failure in your career did you learn the most and why? There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I think, first of all, you have to understand the doctoral process, getting a dissertation. It is a solo journey. You basically are taught to like, Take all these classes, big statistical things. You don't have Dr. Tucker to help you at a, anywhere but UNH. And, you, and then when you get to the point that's there, you have to get, go sequester yourself away inside a building and write this huge behemoth paper that's this big and then never publish that thing again unless you do it in journal articles. It's ridiculous. <laughs> what you should be trained to do is how much you connect. How much can you relate to others? How much can you work with a team like Fred when he comes to you? How much can you work with a team like Anita when she comes to you? How when you have this wonderful idea from this incredibly brilliant young person, how can you make sure it happens? Your ability to relate and re have a strong relationship with your colleagues should be the final test of your doctorate. And probably the place that I've failed the most is with doctoral students, because we have a doctoral program there and they all want to have families and they all want to move other places where they have jobs. And I have the hardest time getting them to graduate because they all go on with their lives, except when someone like Brent Bell comes and says, you're expecting to get married, have a kid, and finish your dissertation all in six months. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. We did it because of Beth, yeah, I asked Beth. <laughs> but, that, but that's it, is that I think I've become more um, vocal against the system of operating in that type of way because it really isn't truly how we get things done. There's lots more questions here, and unfortunately not a whole lot more time. So I want to ask, is there a question you'd like me to ask, or something you'd just like to answer? Trying to think. I think the big thing to understand is how important risking is. To risk is to keep your identity building and growing. And when you're faced with a challenge and you're not able to, con to overcome that challenge and that challenge is facing you right in the very eyes of what you're doing, you have the courage to change. And that's so hard. And that's why the arms folded happens. It's moving that way. The other thing is to be present and be in the moment. Don't think, don't put so much stock in the future. Don't rely on the past. 
Make sure that you live in the present of this time when we're here. Because that, that's what the outdoors taught me. But climbing is so involving with the rock that, that uh, it's such a feeling of grace and beauty as well as harmony to rock climb for me. And uh, it's brought me my greatest joy in life as well as tragedy in that part. But that's the game you play with heavy risk taking. So one of the qualities of Mike, if you've been with him, is, as I said earlier, is that, um, and as Brent alluded to as well, that you find yourself sharing a lot of yourself, but not necessarily hearing a lot about Mike. And so rather than just have Casey and myself ask questions, how we'd like to conclude this is Casey's going to be writing down what you say, and we're going to create, for those who know it, a word cloud. So what that means is basically whether it be what you've heard tonight or spanning back, like in my case, 35 years, um, what's a word or a phrase that when you think of this amazing being and how you've been touched by him, that you would only want you to try to capture it in a word or a phrase, just a word or a phrase. And the way we're going to do it is similar to if you've ever done Zen clap, which is when you feel so moved, just stand up and say that word or phrase. When you sit down, the next person just popcorns up. So we'll do this for about five minutes or so. So first, just take a moment. I know it's really tough. How do you put all of this into one word? And so you also get to repeat a word that you've heard before. because That's kind of the, the rules of a word cloud. While you're thinking, if I could have a service crew turn the lights on so Mike can actually see who's saying these words, that would be wonderful. Once again, some folks are going, what was that again? So when you think <coughs> of Mike Gass, what's a word or phrase that, phrase that comes to mind? Uh, I'd say energized. The real deal. <laughs> <laughs> Mentor. Compassionate.
mentor. I want to explain the jelly bean thing. <laughs> Christina said, you know, you're not getting enough students to come up and see you. I said, well, it's three floors up in an obscure, locked away place in New Hampshire Hall. And she said, you have to do something to get students to come up there. So I brought I have jelly beans there, and I have a big a lounger chair, and granola bars, anything to coax the student upstairs to see me. That's a, and Dr. Tucker is the biggest jelly bean eater of all. <laughs> like to end with a story. Surprise. <laughs> and there will be two parts of the story. One is um, climbing a volcano in Mexico with my partner here to go with. And we had a student who needed to go down before we summited on Orizaba, which is the fifth highest mountain in North America. And um, Pam and I were there, and we needed someone to take it down, and I turned to her, and she just knew that, I, that it was important for me to have her go to the top and to me to take the student down. And just that time exemplifies our career together of just these moments of tragedy and success. And um, I wouldn't be up here without her. And there's a reason why she's 10 years before me. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while to catch up to her. The sparks of the future are here on my right. Then when someone comes to you with their dream, you have to find a way to say yes. That's your passion, is wise in others of what their dreams are to make it reality. That's what a teacher does. Be there as a teacher, like Christian does. I'm sure with his students at Plymouth, I hear them say that all the time. And make sure that you have opportunities to dream big because we are important. You are valuable. And we will have our day in the school system, in the therapy office. The world needs us more than ever before. Thank you for this gift. <laughs> 